And then I'm talking to my husband and saying, you know, oh, we should get all the Thomas Sowell books before they get disappeared. <laughs> and that's a real conversation I'm having, you know, <laughs> like this is not good. <laughs> like all of this, even the conversation we're having, it portends a, a direction that is terrifying to me. Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. So our guest today is Bridget Fettersy. She's joining us from California, Los Angeles. Um, hi, Bridget. Can you see and hear me all right? I can see and hear you. Hello. Good morning. So you are you're a comedian, a writer, your host of a podcast called Walk-Ins Welcome and also your YouTube channel, Fettersy. Um, there's a lot that we want to hear from you today. <laughs> I wanted to begin by actually talking about where you're currently talking to us from, which is the state of California. Around the world, we think of California as this kind of haven of happiness and sunshine and palm lined boulevards and Hollywood and all of the cool stuff. Um, what does it feel like at the moment? That, what are you seeing in, in California? It's a process that's been happening for quite some time and it feels like it's been accelerated by the pandemic and the lockdowns. But I, I've been describing it as pre mageddon and it's a little bit pre-apocalyptic or dystopian. There's just this sense, a lot of it is just because there isn't the normal bustle around and so you're just only seeing the increasing homelessness, which is tragic and it's filthy and there's garbage everywhere. And it's definitely not the Los Angeles I moved to in 2007 when I came back. It's certainly not the Los Angeles I was in in the early 2000s. Right. But a lot of people have sorry. been leaving recently, haven't they? I mean, we have yeah, uh, a lot. Uh, you're not going to follow the exodus and go somewhere else? Uh, no, we might. I've, I've been thinking. I go back and forth. I have family here, and I love the weather. I still I haven't exactly figured out if I can't stand the governance more than I love the weather. But that seems to be everyone in California. <laughs> you talk about governance. I mean, one of the things that has it's been marked for in the last year has been this pretty hardcore approach to lockdowns and to trying to avoid worse results with the virus. How, how do you feel that the people of California are feeling about that? Is, is that still popular? Is there the beginnings of a backlash against it? Do people talk about Florida in comparison? Is, is, is that a thing? Yeah, the, the thing that I've noticed in particularly these liberal cities where there is a backlash, the people were just rich enough to leave. So anyone who felt like they wanted more space and their kids back in school and they just kind of up and left. So there was a huge exodus from places like New York City, from L.A., from and now you're seeing, obviously, this migration to places like North Carolina. I mean, every state is really having a boom and even in California, we're seeing a lot of people coming from New York, which cracks me up, but they just have more space here. You have a yard and so they can so be they be... can be locked in in the sunshine as opposed to locked in. in the <laughs> right. With a pool and a backyard. And I feel the and then in some communities, there's just not the same sense of being locked down. So in the working class communities, they never stopped working and going, you know, the nannies didn't really stop. The gardeners didn't really stop. All, all of these people were still working throughout the entire pandemic. And, um, uh, my husband was working through the whole pandemic. And so there wasn't the same level of fear because there was still, um, even though there might have been more COVID in some of these communities because they were still working, um, there didn't seem to be the same level of uh, neurotic, paranoid fear that has taken over a lot of the people who had the luxury, which it was truly just a luxury, of working from their house and not interacting with anybody because they had people delivering all their stuff and Amazon. I think it's fair to make a connection between the COVID response and that slightly elite tilted 
finger wagging sense of moral righteousness that has gone with it. Is it fair to make a connection between that and other political trends of the last few years, which have some of that same self righteousness about them? What's so shocking to me recently is even, you know, we have recently this discussion of vaccine passports has kind of bubbled up and you would need them to go shopping, to travel, to do basically anything. And I've seen this floated just by certain people who are interviewed. You know, I feel like it's always one of those things that they're floating to see what to get the temperature on it, on what people are feeling about it. And it's honestly shocking to me how many people are OK with this. And I can't figure out if it's just because people like being told what to do or need to be told what to do. And then, like you said, there's a sense of self-righteousness that goes along with that. So you're you're basically following the lead and then you get to be arrogant and and take the moral high ground. Does that mean you're not you're not OK with it, Bridget? You're, you're not in favor of vaccine? No, possible? no. Why? No, I think that. It seems crazy to me to have to have something digitally that says that kind of tracks wherever you go. I guess it would be digital. It's not like you're going to get your shot and have some piece of paper and be like, here, I got my passport. You're going to obvious. This would obviously be something that needs to be rolled out on some standardized federal level. And in order for it to really work. And I don't know, there's something really dystopian and creepy to me about that. It comes from the other end of the same state, doesn't it really? I mean, a lot of the, the Silicon Valley kind of technology complex, which is always looking at the next innovation, the next thing that can sort of dominate more and more of your life. It feels like the energy for vaccine passports is coming from Silicon Valley in some way. It's, it's another step towards a, a, a more digitized existence. Yeah. And, and what else gets added to that? <laughs> you know, is it, is it just COVID or suddenly, OK, so you have your COVID vaccine and that's all you need for this passport? What else gets added to your passport over time? Um, does your credit score get added to it? Does you know how? I don't know. There's something I don't like it. I my whole reaction to it is viscerally like, no, 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 no. This seems like overreach and it feels I it's I just think about times when you needed passports to get around your country and generally it's like the bad times yeah apartheid and in Nazi Germany you know you're not you're not exactly I, I'm trying to think of a time when you need a passport to get around your own country when that is a good thing, when the country's in a good place. So that instinct that you had, that kind of visceral rejection of it, where is that coming from and who else has that, do you think? Do you think that's a kind of libertarian impulse and are you going to find people in the Midwest or in southern states who would more likely agree with you? Or wh where are your kind of uh, fellow brethren who would resist such a move. I do see a lot of people on the right. And, you know, this is an interesting transition. I was having a great discussion yesterday with somebody for my podcast and we were uh, Jonathan Heights where came up in the righteous mind and the characteristics of, you know, people who tend to be more conservative versus more liberal. And one of the things that would make you more conservative would be a respect for authority. But that has drastically changed in the past year. But I don't, I don't really see how the, the, the liberals are so OK with stuff like vaccine passports. I suppose it's a it's a it's a moral safety um, argument. This is the same group of people that and this is what doesn't you know, I try to get my mind around a lot of the illogical arguments that flow from all of our media and politicians lately and just the activists and one of the art, how is this going to be enforced? How, how would that work? And you're talking in the same breath, because we have this whole, you know, kind of controversy about what's going on in Georgia around Georgia voting laws. 
one of those being that you would need an ID to vote um, with an absentee ballot. And the argument is always that this hurts the most vulnerable and these poor people who can't figure out how to use the internet and register to vote and get or, and or get an ID. And then in the same breath, they'll be saying, you know, we need to make these mandatory vaccine passports and they're probably going to be digital, but who is that going to leave out? You know, that if you're making the argument that not everybody has cell phones, iPhones, computers, and Wi-Fi, and you want some kind of digital passport so that you can move around America, um, who exactly do you think will be left out of that? And by that same argument. At least in the UK, I don't know if this is true in the US, but I suspect so that so-called vaccine hesitancy or people communities that are reluctant to take the vaccine is, is higher in um, ethnic minority communities, uh, at least here it is. Um, so you're faced with potentially a very sinister idea that the people who are going to be excluded from pubs or flights or restaurants or are going to be more members of ethnic minority communities, which also feels wrong. Well, that's like all these lockdowns. They always felt wrong to me because it, again, I, it hurts the most vulnerable populations. The, the kids who are wealthy, no matter what, no matter what ethnicity they might be, they had access to tutors. They have Wi-Fi. They all have devices. There are teachers who talk about a, a third of their kids never logged in from March of 2020. And there are there was a recent study that they they kind of guesstimated that three million kids basically disappeared from the school systems. Now, these are kids who generally don't have somebody who can sit with them while they're doing their Zoom pajama school and they don't have devices. They maybe don't have Wi-Fi. And so you're, again, hurting the most vulnerable when they shut down the playgrounds I'm like, these kids who have yards, they're not the ones who are being hurt. It's the kids who live in apartment complexes with tons of other people, and this is where they go play. All of these lockdowns ostensibly seem to hurt the more vulnerable populations that they were supposed to be on the face helping. But I, I don't see that at all. If we just broaden it a bit, like we've seen the last year these lockdowns have been the kind of physical face and the, the latest level in some of the craziness that is happening. Uh, but it all belongs to a, a, a kind of development of liberal thinking, doesn't it, that starts life very friendly. And that's where Hollywood and California get such a, its friendly reputation from, and has somehow managed to turn so many corners that it's no longer very friendly. Is that how you experience it in other aspects? So let's say like entertainment, you are a comedian. They're not so open minded and friendly about comedy or any of those things. I've written a lot about this, the creeping authoritarianism that I saw coming from both sides during the Trump years. Um, the left feels much more insidious to me because it seems social and They've always had control of in it's always been left leaning the media, academia, um, Hollywood. Obviously, we we know all of these things have somewhat of a, a or an, a pretty obvious liberal bias at this point. And what do you mean when you say you, so it even means if, it seems social? What does that mean? Um. When I talk to people about why they're self-censoring, it's because they feel like they can't say certain things. And that's not being enforced by the government yet, although we are headed in that direction in California. But it is being enforced socially. You know, we, we have all this kind of, I feel, over constantly talking about cancel culture, which I'm frankly bored with, but it's an important conversation. But you see it in these little mobs that pop up and will try and destroy someone's life. And I'm not talking about big people in the media and people who have platforms and 
celebrities who have a lot of money, people will try and come after them. It's more the little micro cancellations that you don't really hear very much about that are happening within families and communities. And I always talk about one woman who wrote me who got kicked out of her her mommy group on Facebook because she said something that was um, they felt she was misgendering a child. It was something crazy. And you're seeing lots of instances of this. And then people who are petrified of saying anything at work and are being made to go to these kind of diversity and inclusion trainings and they can't say anything about whether or not they agree with the stuff. It's just something they have to attend in order to go to their job. And so none of it is, again, it's not being mandated by the government, but there's a lot of social pressure to get in line with this rapidly changing um, language. You know, I'll, there's it's, a, it's almost like there's a whole new vernacular and, and it's like a, code. a whole new... It's a code you need yeah. to learn in order to... That's why the, the comparisons with Soviet regimes or the current Chinese government, you know, there is a sense that if you want to escalate the ranks and do well, you need to be friends with the right people and say the right things. I mean, I wonder if you feel any of that. You, you know, you're sitting here being pretty outspoken, I would say. You don't feel, from this point of view, it doesn't seem like you're someone who is uh, shrinking in terror at uh, whatever people are going to judge you for. But do you feel that ever? I did. And then I pushed back against it. And now I feel like I'm going to speak as long as I can. Um, I'm not really big enough for anybody to come after me and target me. I'm not I don't I have some very small influence, but it's not it's not like I'm making waves. Um, I'm not my platforms aren't big. You know, I just don't feel like I have uh, a target on me. Do you think if you got if you got bigger, they you'd be more vulnerable? I'd be vulnerable from the plat the tech platforms. I'm I've made myself. I basically I liberated myself five years ago when this happened. I accepted. Okay, I might never write in a Hollywood writers room unless it's a show that I created, and I might never do some of the things that I maybe wanted to do when I moved out here. But if that re that if that means that I have to put up some mandatory trans visibility day post on my Twitter just because I need to signal that I'm in the in group and, um, and put a, you know, black box on my, on my Instagram during the protests over the summer. I don't, it all feels, I know these people in real life, you know, they, <laughs> I know, I know who they are. I know what they're saying behind closed doors. It's so much of it is just um, like a. It, it's all just so much of it is an act and they're doing it to play a game and stay in the in group. But I'm not sure. I wonder how much some of these people even believe what they're saying. I don't even know if they do. You talk about how there's like there's a sort of public. It's performative, basically. So if you're a celebrity or something, you have to go through these motions publicly. And I know that there are PR advisors who will pretty much recommend, oh, you should do this in order to make sure that you're on the right side of this. Do you think there will come a point when that gap becomes so big that it sort of breaks? Um, and that if everyone is commonly accepting that this is a sort of somewhat meaningless performance, the power of it will just suddenly disappear. I go back and forth on it because some days I feel like, yes, maybe that's the case. And I see so many people who have broken away. I'm making a, a very comfortable living, doing what I want to do, saying what I want to say. And I work for myself and it's honestly the dream. And so in some ways, I'm grateful that I took that risk and just said, I would rather be free than have to silo who I am privately and publicly. And I've seen people who have been fearless and in comedy in particular and are, are making really good living. So in some respects, the market is rewarding the people who are being fearless. You're also seeing this with Substack. You know, they're, the people who are breaking away from the mainstream media and starting their own Substacks are having a lot of success. And these old 
kind of the old guard media just seems too flat on its feet to be able to pivot. And as much as they can try and control people socially, there's too much freedom on the internet. Now, that being said, my biggest fear is when you see things like, for instance, what happened in the wake of the president being deplatformed from all of the social medias, which is still bananas to me. And then basically disappeared like a, almost like a mob hit, you know, like a technical mob hit. And then, and I'm no fan of his, by the way, he's not, I think as a person, he is repugnant, but it still seemed crazy to me. And then when Parler tried to, you know, there's always this idea of like, build your own internet, build your own platform. And Parler did that with as a competition to Twitter. And then Amazon basically said they wouldn't host them. And so when I started and seeing Google things like- Google said they would not stock the app, at which point right, it's right. finished before it even started. Right. And when you start seeing the financial institutions like PayPal, and I just had a great interview with Cherie DeVille. She's an adult film star. And she was talking about how Visa and MasterCard have been throttling what porn can show and what it can't for years. And when you start, so she was laughing kind of about how these, I was laughing about how conservatives and, and the adult (laughs) film industry have become these weird allies and pushing back against these financial institutions, determining what we can and can't purchase or use with our money. You're seeing, um, weird things like, okay, it's fine. Recently, Dr. Seuss was a big thing. This wasn't I look at it, okay, the Dr. Seuss Foundation wants to get rid of these books, whatever, that's their decision. But then when you have eBay saying we won't, we're we're delisting or whatever it is, unlisting anybody trying to sell these books, okay, now we're in another weird territory. When the mainstream media, the sort of legacy establishment media was fixed, there was always the new technology to disrupt it and sort of free ideas could go that way. If the new technology now becomes fully gatekeepered and and controlled, it is much harder to see where the conversation can go, isn't it? I mean, we I I just this morning we were getting a bit paranoid over here at Unheard HQ because if you type in Jonathan Sumption, who is a recent interviewee of ours, uh, into YouTube, the video does not appear, and it's done two hundred and fifty thousand views, and it was very recent. But all of these other ones are shown and, and ours isn't and I yeah, you know, I'm just thinking I don't want to be that guy who yeah. is deeply paranoid that someone yeah. in the center of YouTube has kind of got it in for me. But I, I I'm beginning to think there is no other explanation than that yeah. you know, what do what do we do about that that battle? It's hard not to be paranoid. I was going through this the other day where I was saying I feel like I'm on some algorithmic um like uh list you know like uh where it's just like don't don't share this girl's content don't it it felt like I was in an algorithmic black hole or a vortex and I that could just be me you know maybe that's just the market it could just be and it's super hard not to get paranoid it's it's definitely hard when you're seeing them openly doing things like what Amazon did with Parler And what you hear about with Google manipulating algorithms, we don't know anything about what these algorithms are pushing. I I tend to just also be grateful to be on any of them. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm like, well, they are a private company. I'm just happy to be here. But it's at the point where they're so big that you don't, in many ways, you don't exist if you aren't in those public spaces. And it would be detrimental to me to have, I mean, I always joke on my show on dumpster fire on YouTube. Um, I'm like, I'm just going to keep talking until I can't because I, I feel like you're constantly avoiding like the eye of Sauron. <laughs> you know, you're just, you're kind of like, all right, we're going to keep on talking until we say something that we didn't know was the wrong thing to say. I mean, look at look at Donald Trump. 
I mean, everyone is saying, oh, he's got a master plan, he's about to launch his new platform, etc. It takes a while to build hundreds of millions of followers. I think even Donald Trump is going to struggle to replicate the kind of reach he had using those platforms. I mean, I just got a kind of moment there, Bridget, that here we are, two people who are really by no means crazies, who are kind of preaching dangerous ideas, are getting people to go out and kill people or have hateful thoughts. I would say we're pretty sort of sensible kind of people. And yet we are having a conversation about what we should do in the eventuality that we are censored, kicked off, silenced. And it's a very real threat. And it's just kind of amazing that it's reached this point where we need to have this conversation. Yeah, that's what's chilling about it. And I don't I don't know where I I feel like somewhere along the way, the Internet was this wild west and it was glorious. And it still is in many instances. And you have this fresh leveling of the playing field where anybody can thrive and put their content out there and do their best. And it felt pretty even. And now it feels like somewhere along the way, the people who are building these platforms or they got so big and obviously bad people are going to exist on these platforms and use them for bad things. And they realized they needed to try and, or they felt they needed, they Try, needed to try and control some of this. Facebook is a really great example of some of the things that have gone wrong in other countries due to their lax. I, I mean, they just got so huge. They're massive, especially Facebook. It's bigger than it's it's how many billions of people are on that. It's insane. And how do you watch what every single person is? You can't. So and the algorithms seem to really take on a life of their own in terrifying ways. And so I don't know if they just got scared and tried to regulate. And now they feel like, oh, we thought that this would make the world better. And it's actually, you know, making everything worse. And now we need to be the ones who control this. Money is the other factor here that when in the early days of the internet, these were kind of experimental disruptive forces. And now they are quite literally the biggest companies in the world, bigger than the oil giants, the motor giants. They are the biggest companies in the world, which means there are thousands and thousands of very powerful shareholders whose capital is growing and growing by investing in these technology companies. And they want to preserve their growing share price. And the, the, the businessman wants an organized, controlled, safe environment. And so there's a sort of you know, it, again, it might sound conspiratorial or Marxist or whatever, but it, it ultimately feels like capital is behind that push. Have I have I gone too far? I don't I don't really know. Yeah, there's shareholders and there's big companies and I, it's hard. It's very hard. I was just talking to, like I said, my friend who runs the Conspirituality podcast. He's one of the co-hosts and he is very grounded in reason. And we were talking about just how conspiratorial everything is right now and how hard it is not to go down these paths. And even all this stuff that you're seeing, you know, we have this ongoing joke on dumpster fire about the agenda 2030 and the great reset. But then you start hearing the language being parroted by all the world leaders. And you're like, how am I not supposed to, how am I supposed to not be in a conspiracy theorist in 2021? Do you think we're, we're all going to end up there, Bridget, when we talk in uh, six months or in a year, we'll just be completely exchanging the latest ultra conspiracy? Do you think that's where we're headed? I don't know. I, I get so nervous. You know, there, there are days I say I have my good days and my bad days with this because it is in many ways like a frog in a boiling water in the frog in the boiling water where, OK, we're going to lock down everybody in the world. There's a reason for that. Everyone kind of goes along with it because they're being, for the most part, they're like, yeah, this is uh, socially the right thing to do. It's a sacrifice I'm making for my fellow man. If you had the ability to do it, you were doing the right thing. And then it was the mask mandates. And then it was, and suddenly it was all of these uh, powers that were taken in an emergency, powers that are rarely given back. I've seen this from the Patriot Act uh, uh, post 9-11 here. And 
then now it's just this idea that we're floating about, glo- you know, vaccine passports and, um, oh no, we don't really mean this seriously. I, I just, uh, and then I'm talking to my husband and saying, you know, oh, we should get all the Thomas Sowell books before they get disappeared. <laughs> and that's a real conversation I'm having, you know, <laughs> like this is not good. <laughs> like all of this, even the conversation we're having, it portends a, a direction that is terrifying to me. Definitely. And with, there's one other factor I want to throw in here, uh, which is sex, because we haven't we talked about this kind of dystopian direction in lockdowns and politics and everything. If we weren't children of men enough, um, it turns out that young people are more and more celibate. People are having less sex than they used to. Um, sperm counts are going down. <laughs> um, we just had this Dr. Shanna Swan on the show telling us about that. And it feels like the, the final act in this uh, new dystopia we're creating is that somehow sex is also going to be cancelled. What's your take on that? Yeah, that's been weird, too. It's like people don't even talk about it anymore. I mean, I, I wrote for Playboy for years and I had a column and people wrote me questions and I did the Playboy advisor and it was something that you saw. And now it feels like the conversation has shifted less about the actual awkwardness of sex and, you know, I'm having a problem with my boyfriend or I, you know, erectile dysfunction, or I feel insecure about my, my like love handles or something, you know, there, this, this kind of simple, what seems quaint now. And now it's this conversation that's shifted to, gender and non-binary and um what is a biological male and a female i i i i I, and maybe it's just maybe i'm just the, the old lady being like these crazy kids and their newfangled ideas about what it means to be a man and a woman or maybe it's uh i mean it's politicized isn't it it's like all of these things, it's become fraught and tense and politicized. And that the kind of more intuitive, obvious answer is no longer the right answer. We need to be thinking all the time. Oh, don't, don't say the obvious thing. You need to say this other thing and be retrained to think differently. That's the same atmosphere on gender questions as it is in other parts of life, isn't it? The fact that I worry about saying boys and girls are different and getting deplatformed is insane. And everyone's gone along with this. <laughs> you know, like there's it seems crazy to me. I feel like I just that's where I get real, that's where it gets dark for me. You know, I'm like, well, if they can just convince us to go along and say that boys and girls aren't different, what else in the world could they po- we, we could we will believe literally anything at that point the parallel reality. I mean, we're sounding like such old curmudgeons here, Bridget. (laughs) We're like the old days when a boy could be a boy and life was simple and you could go out without a mask. You know, are we are we sounding like kind of grandparents in this conversation? Yeah, we are (laughs) sounding like grandparents. And it's I I don't know. I mean, I feel uh, I have no problem with a lot of it, you know, like a lot of the progress stuff. I don't, I don't care. I'm so like, live and let live, do whatever you want to do. Be what say you, you can be whatever you want to be. Your pronouns can be whatever they want to be. I don't really care. I want you to live the happiest, best life. I don't know that I think it's great that everybody is so invested in making their entire identity about these immutable characteristics, or in some cases, mutable characteristics, which is another paradigm I can't get my mind around. Um, your sex, your gender, your ethnicity, and that you're leading with that as your identity. You know, you're, this is what you build your entire world around instead of what is, you know, what gives you meaning beyond these traits that you were just born with, or it just seems, I feel in so many ways like, we're going backwards. 
We started the um, conversation talking about being politically homeless, not belonging to one herd or the other. Do you feel that you are drifting in a conservative direction? I mean, is, uh, is that happening? Um, which, and if not, which herd, which, which group is there going to be for you? Or do you need to create a new one? Here's whenever conservatives talk about sex, I'm like, OK, yeah, I'm not I'm not a conservative. I'm too libertarian about sex, too. I'm like, oh, whatever. Like, if you want to get married to, to I don't care about gay marriage. I don't care. Um, I don't care about these things. I do care when it starts. Um, when you start kind of enforcing language and policing language and when. Now we're talking about when the conversation shifts to hormone blockers for children. Those are things where I'm like, OK, we we should be able to have a, a disagreement or an argument about that without me being kicked off of a platform. Is there a gang for you? I mean, are there people out there? Here's the, the thing. Who, it's been chosen well for me. If, if there say that there's this magical civil war that everybody is always threatening in America online or joking about. Um, I'm. I'm the team has been been picked for me, whether or not I consider myself pretty liberal and many of my values and progressive, um, they would never have me. I'm, I'm not, they've already decided that I'm on team red. I listened to people on clubhouse. Um, I went into a room and it was basically a group therapy session that turned into a struggle session. And it was the most chilling aspect of it, other than the language, the new language that everybody's using of holding space. I mean, it is like this therapeutic language that has gone mainstream and the trauma. And a woman suggested that speech might not be violence. And they booted her out of the room. They had a whole cry in where they were all recovering from the trauma of this woman saying this. And then they allowed her to come back in if she was willing to apologize. They let her back in and then she came back in and apologized to all of them. And then her apology wasn't good enough. And then she had to keep apologizing. And the way the most chilling aspect of it was the, the way in which people were speaking. So they were talking like this. You could tell they were terrified, terrified of crossing whatever invisible line and choosing their speech. And this whole idea, you know, there are certain things that I think are catastrophic to a society, a healthy democracy and functioning society. One of those is speech is violence. We have speech. So hopefully we can avoid violence. Like, I feel like anyone who says that has never been punched in the face before. Like what? What are you talking about? And these are often the people who are being violent out in the streets. Like it does, it just, this kind of stuff makes me insane. Bridget, we had Dave Rubin on the show a few days ago. And at the end, there was suddenly a discussion of whether he was going to run for governor of California or if uh, Gavin Newsom is recalled. And he seemed, I would say, pretty interested in the idea. Um, you know, maybe maybe that's what's going to happen to you too, Bridget. You can be his running mate, and uh, there'll be this new administration in town. I have no desire to get. That's the funny thing. I just have no desire to get into politics. My the things that I'm passionate about. I never wanted any of this. This is the opening line of my book. <laughs> like I didn't want any of this. I came out to LA to be, a, you know, a writer and an actress and like sit on a balcony and flip through scripts and watch dolphins and and be on set and make content that made people happy. I want to tell stories about life and hardship and overcoming hardship and trying to give people the sense that they have any kind of possibility lifting people up out of their own circumstances and that hero's journey. I think the hero's journey is so important to humanity. We all need it. We all need these stories. Every story is just a hero's journey. That's all every single story is. So your your hero's journey is not ending with being deputy governor of California, then it sounds like. No, I just want to I want to make I want to make people laugh and feel inspired. And, you know, my wheelhouses are like comedy and sex and relationships and talking about um, mental health. And I'm in recovery. I've been sober 
seven years. I've, I, my, if I had any mission in life, it would be to help people get out of their own way. But you can't even say that without being told that you're like an imperial, that's like the language of colonialism. Bridget, we've run out of time now. Thank you so much for all of that. I would say you said you hope to inspire. I found it inspiring. I bet you our uh, viewers did as well. That was really great. And uh, let's talk again soon. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you for having me. That was Bridget Fettersy. She says she doesn't want to be a politician and fair play to her, but I for one would vote for her if she did. Thanks to her for her time. Uh, check out her YouTube channel, Fettersy, or her podcast, which is called Walk-Ins Welcome. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Hope you did too. This was Lockdown TV.